Thank you very much, Covington, for uh, coming along. Got it filled up quickly at the last minute. So, uh, yeah, welcome to my session. My name's John LeDrew. I've been working in the software industry, doing a whole number of different things for, well, well over 20 years now. And uh, so far, my greatest achievement, I think, is the fact that still, uh, and as of uh, 2 p.m., what time is it now? Two, yeah, it's about 2 p.m., maybe 2 p.m. UK time. Uh, I still am on the first page of search results in Google for swearing and nudity, uh, which uh, I'll, I'll let you guys work out. Surprisingly safe for work, you know, sorry, you know. Uh, but yeah, still there. Um, so this is a talk about stories. The stories we tell others about who we are. The stories we tell about <coughs> where we've been the stories we tell about where we want to go, and perhaps who we want to be. The time is about September 2000. Harry and Sally meet for the first time when they start as graduates at the National Institute for Romantic Comedies. They were both excited to start their new job and feeling really energised and positive. Alf, one of the older team members, comments on how cheery the new starters are. Duh, he says. They don't know what it's really like yet. The time is March 2017, the place, Manchester, mm. my house. My relationship of nearly 13 years has just ended. My partner's just told me she wants to leave me. I knew the relationship was struggling, but I was blind to the reality. It completely threw me. I was still very much in love. We have two children. I was stuck between the sheer panic of what the hell happens now and the loss of the relationship. We'd been together since I was 19, and as we grew up together, we also grew apart. It seemed like everything was collapsing, not just the relationship, but my entire identity. I'd become a we before I knew who me was. And without that we, who the hell was I? I realized... I realized that I was having this identity crisis, and I, I set out to try to recreate myself. I wanted to transform myself to be anyone else, just not the broken person I felt I was. So I'd like to invite you all to close your eyes for just a moment, and then take a deep breath. Let that breath out as slowly as you can, and let your breath return to normal. I'd like you to really think about this question. Who are you? And who are you really? I don't mean who you want to be tomorrow or in 10 years. Who are you right now, in this room, this minute, this second? And who else knows this person? Maybe lots of people. Maybe just a few. Maybe just you. Hold on to that. Now take a few more breaths in your own time, and then open your eyes. So a few months go by, and uh, with some fanfare, leadership announce that the organization is going agile. And so are Harry and Sally. The other team on Harry and Sally's floor have already gone agile, whatever that means, and uh, they're doing really well, apparently. Someone called an agile coach came in and told them that they weren't allowed to uh, say how long anything took. It was just how many points it is. And that they couldn't talk about features. They were, they were stories or something like that. Some of the other people on the team are quite resistant to these new ideas. But Harry and Sally heard about this agile thing at uni, so they're kind of okay with it. That lunchtime, Sally creates a JIRA ticket and assigns it to Harry. As Sally, I would like Harry to accompany me to lunch so that I can get to know him. She estimates it at eight points. So after about six months, the coach leaves, and at first, things seem to be going really well. Uh, but after a while, things start to really 
stop working. The same things keep coming up again and again in their retrospectives, and the same things make them fail again and again. <coughs> Harry and Sally would have lunch together most days. They, uh, <clears throat> they could have a good moan about everything, despite their frustration. It was nice to have each other around. Harry liked Sally. She'd made the last few months tolerable. She was smart, confident, funny, everything he felt he wasn't. Out of his league, obviously. But he was glad they could be friends all the same, especially with the way things had been going. They just didn't get it. It all seemed to be working so well that they even launched on time. But then it just felt like there wasn't enough time for anything, and the pressure kept increasing. The team couldn't work out what they were doing wrong. So I think a lot of us have seen situations like this. You have a team, and you introduce a wonderful, talented, agile coach, and uh, they arrive in the organization, they go on about all of the fantastic agile that you're going to be doing. At first, maybe they're a little skeptical, but you know they kind of get in the groove uh, eventually, and by the time the coach leaves, they're all scrummed up to their Kanbans. Now, uh, they, they really dig in the vibe, and things are going really, really well. But then uh, something goes wrong, and, and that thing that was working, that particular dance move was working, uh, it doesn't seem to work anymore. And people start to feel stuck, and cues begin to build up in, in all of the wrong places. But, but it's OK, because the Agile coach left a manual, they left a guide to show them what they're doing wrong. And what I find is, is that when we're working with teams or individuals, and we're trying to communicate a new idea or a topic to them, because they don't know anything about this, this is all new, and apparently this thing, this agile thing, is working really well for everyone else, maybe even within that same organization. That there's no way that that process could possibly be just wrong for their context. They just need to, they must be the ones that are wrong. So just before we separated, I uh, had made a decision. I'd been working in very technical roles for about 17 years, and I wanted to work with people first. So I left this very technically oriented um, contract, and I started uh, to rebrand. And, uh, and then my partner left me. So I was unemployed, uh, newly single, broke, abandoned, alone, and I had no idea who I was. So, feeling like a protagonist in my own sci-fi cliché, I did what anyone would do. I accepted a speaking gig in Detroit. So, I was also going to be running a workshop, but because I wasn't really known at all, I sold a total of no places, uh, so instead had two days to myself. So I headed out into Detroit with my camera. I'd never visited Detroit before, but as I walked the streets, I got the feeling of a city rising from the ashes. This is a city with huge problems that have been with it for more than half a century. But it's full of hope. The people are so full of hope. So I was having a wonderful time, but my friends and family were worried about me, being in the delicate situation that I was recently found myself, and that I, I looked like a dumb white tourist walking around the wrong parts of town. Uh, my mum calls me up and just says, uh, Darling, you know there are guns in America, don't you? On the last day, I'd been exploring downtown and I realized that in my excitement to leave the, my little apartment that morning, I'd actually left my bag, and the battery in my camera had run out, I didn't have a spare battery, and my wallet was there. So I end up essentially walking back, a sort of 30-minute walk back to the apartment. As I turn a corner, a man steps out in front of me. He's filthy, has plastic bags wrapped around his feet, a big cut on his forehead. He just stands there and looks at me, and looks at the camera, and just says, Hey, man, take a picture of me. I'm the real Detroit. 
So, question. How do we react or respond to change, big changes, either personal or professional? Anyone, just shout out. Pardon? You go first. <laughs> That's cheating, you see. I've asked you the question. Uh, fear. Fear is a good answer. Panic sometimes. Just, pardon? Resistance, which is one thing that leads to another in many situations. Yeah. I think that... Grab some water. The, that a lot of the time, we tend to freak out with change. Even good change to some degree, even positive change, there's often a huge amount of intrepidation towards good change. Most people are feeling exceptionally positive, probably on the day of their marriage, but there's a very large part of them that's kind of freaking out as well. That me. So, I think many people will have heard this. In his 1962 book, a guy called Professor Everett Rogers popularized a thing called the diffusion of innovations theory. And this talks about how a new idea or piece of technology or behavior um, is picked up by any given group. So you start off with 2.5% of the group are the innovators. They are going to adopt whatever you throw at them. The next 13.5% are the early adopters. So they're going to wait a little bit Let's see how well the innovators do, and then eventually they'll be like, yeah, OK, it seems, seems kind of cool. And then you have the early majority. Well, they're going to wait for that lot to make sure that whatever they're doing is absolutely fine, and eventually they'll do it. Then we have the late majority and the laggards. They might never touch that new idea. The thing that got me, uh, actually, was a conversation with a friend of mine, Linda Rising, we were talking about, we wonder how long this behavior is. Now, this, this research dates from 1962. Um, but I think people have been behaving like this for quite a long time. And Linda gave me a lovely example, which is, imagine the, the kind of caveman, OK? And 2.5% of this, I don't know, caveman village thing uh, noticed this amazing berry bush, OK? And this berry bush is, is amazing. These are like ripe, lush, red berries, they look beautiful, OK? And obviously, 2.5% of that group, they just dive on this bush. They're wolfing down the berries like crazy. And then the next 13.5% of the group are kind of like, oh, those berries do look pretty good. We'll give them 24 hours. Let's, let's see what they look like in the morning. And then a couple of weeks later, maybe, the, the next 34% are kind of like, well, people seem pretty keen on these berries. You know, and then someone's like, yeah, well, have you seen the recent peer-reviewed study? You know, the last time, the blueberries, someone grew a third arm. Yeah, maybe we give, should we give, it, a, we give it a few more weeks. Give it a few more weeks. I like the idea of cavemen talking about peer-reviewed studies. <laughs> the, then we have the late majority. You know, and they're kind of like, well, everyone seems to be eating the berries now. I'm, I'm not really sure. And there's, I was, well, you know what? My wife, she snuck in a few of the berries in last night's dinner, and, and they were actually pretty nice. But I, I don't know. I, I only ate one. I'm going to see how I feel. I don't know, in a month or two. <laughs> the laggards? No, that then they might never touch the berries unless they're, uh, unless the wives are more, <laughs> wives are more forceful, perhaps. So. Can anyone imagine why this might be beneficial to human behavior? Any ideas? Survival, yes, yeah, survival. Basically, th this behavior, which actually there is a, a number of studies that followed on from the initial theory that kind of believe that this is a, essentially a kind of evolutionary behavior to some degree, and this distribution seems to be fairly common, uh, is that what we're saying is that 2.5%, we're willing to sacrifice 2.5% of the, of the human population in order, to, uh, in order to ensure the survival of the rest. Because actually, if 2.5% of the population died round the lovely lush berries, and the 97.5% said, well, really glad I didn't taste those, <laughs> here we are today, and we can thank the many 2.5% of innovators. An interesting thing to remember is that in the tech sector, there is a bias towards innovators. So just remember where you stand, OK? In the, uh, if you're the first person to raise your hand up and say, I want to use the new framework that's just come out yesterday, I want it in production, you know who you are. 
Okay, that's where you are. You're the testing ground for the rest of society. You know. Uh, <laughs> so, what? This emotion, fear. Fear drives all of this. Fear stops us from trying the berries. And what's interesting is, is that given that group, what this research tells us is, outside of that 2.5 percent of the innovators in a given group, the other 97 and a half. To some varying degree, are going to experience a fear response that is going to stop them or make them resist a potential change, whether that change is positive or negative. So, if there is always fear, to some degree, in any given group, how do we guide teams towards positive change? So. I was born in、uh, North London, a stone's throw away from the old Highbury Stadium. For those that <laughs> follow football,、um, I don't. That's、so、literally the only thing I know about it.、Uh, it was down the end of my road. It was noisy. So, after about three primary schools came and went, I kind of started to realise that this school thing probably wasn't going to be for me. I really loved learning and loved learning then. It was just this teaching that was really getting on my tits. So. I、uh, just after my tenth birthday, we moved from multicultural North London、uh, to a very small village in North Yorkshire.、Uh, this little village in North London, North Yorkshire, was、uh, was kind of to to London as I don't know. Speaking here to all of you is to locking myself in a cupboard and speaking to my own reflection.、Um, when I was ten,、uh, this was this was really wonderful.、Um, But by the time I was 13 and realised I was at least an hour away from anything resembling civilisation, it, it all seemed a lot less wonderful. I was also really struggling at school.、Uh, my handwriting was terrible, and、uh, and one day when I was 14, a teacher sat me down and said, "JP, I was called JP back then.、Um, JP, you're going to need to improve your handwriting, or you're going to you're going to fail your exams." Which are, were two years from then. And I thought, well, at that point. I've been failing to write properly for ten years. Seems unlikely I'm going to solve this problem on my own in in the next two.、Uh, so I decided to leave school. I、uh, I remember very calmly announcing to my parents、uh, that I was going to homeschool myself for the next couple of years until I could find a job.、Um, And、uh, they're actually pretty supportive of this,、um, uh, but you see, my parents are puppeteers. So I think when when I said,、uh, "Parents, I'd like to go into IT," that was a little bit like the the child of accountant saying, "I want to run away and join the circus." So I think they were quite relieved that I at least was taking a sort of non-standard route.、Uh, they were far more comfortable with.、Um, so at almost 16, I did、uh, get a. I had a job working for a small software house in London, and I moved back to London as a lodger in my old、uh, childhood home. My old childhood bedroom being a somewhat ironic place to start my my new adult life. So obviously, as you know, at 16 you're unbreakable, and obviously you know at 16 you're not unbreakable. I was running faster than I ever could to keep up with my peers. I was playing at adulthood, and it was really hard. Fast forward now to just before my 19th birthday, and、uh, courtesy of the pre-financial crash world, I was over 25,000 pounds in debt, and、uh, I was still playing at adulthood, still trying to keep up with my peers. The credit cards finally dried up, but after finding a new job, I moved out to, to Windsor, and I got a new apartment.、Uh, this, this new apartment that was far more expensive than I could really afford. Um, but I couldn't admit that. Obviously,、uh, I had a, an agreement with the creditors now, so I was free. You know, it was amazing. I、uh, I also decorated the apartment and threw a party to show all my friends just how grown up I was. I couldn't really afford the party, and、uh, still playing at adulthood. Fast forward eight months, and I lost this job suddenly and unexpectedly. And now I've defaulted on that arrangement with my creditors, and I've got no money for rent. I'm on the phone to the bank, and the bank's told me that due to my newfound credit status, they were going to have to close the account. I completely failed. No job, 
no money. It was impossible for me to pretend. I couldn't play at adulthood anymore. I was smack bang in the middle of an adult situation, and it was really shit. You spend your entire childhood wanting to grow up until you do, and then you just wish you could go back to when life was simpler. So, unemployed and broke, I moved back to London, back in with my dad, back in my old childhood bedroom. And shortly after that, I got into that relationship. This lasted 13 years, and it wasn't really good for me, and it wasn't great for her. And there I was, sat on that sofa, thinking, if only I could transform myself, then everything would be better. So, I believe that when we look at teams or individuals or uh, organisations, for that matter, that we can break them down into two parts. We have the context and the structure. So. The context is the the work, the work that people do, anything that they are working on. That could be um, you know, software in some cases, it could be the requirements coming in, it could be whatever, whatever that te particular team is doing, plus the people that are working on it, because that context is changing all the time. Both the requirements change, but also the people change, the team might change structure. So this is always changing. Then you have the structure. Now, the structure is the, pardon me, precipitous clicks. The structure is the process, the way that team works, plus, again, the people. The structure is a team's response to their changing context. That context is always changing over time, and a team will become aware of that and build the structure that best supports their context. So this is a, a little animation of structure. The orange line is the structure, and this is the context changing over time. When people see this, a lot of times people go, that is my organization. We are completely inflexible. We never change. There's no agility. We're just to this flat line. The reality is, is I've never seen a company like this, ever. This is closer to what I see in a lot of companies. Woof. Uh, now, I don't know if anyone's been in an organization like this, but I tend to find here there's something like, we're all going to implement SAFE now. And then, oh, actually, no, we don't want that. We're going to, a different consultancy has paid us a lot of money, uh, or rather, we paid them a lot of money, if only it worked that way. Uh, and uh, <laughs> um, and now we're, now we're going to do something different, and now we have some organizational restructuring, and then boof, boof. And the thing is, is the, the analogy that I find people use for big organizations when they're talking about why they never change is, uh, is they're like, you know, it's like turning a, uh, an aircraft carrier. You know, they're really big things that take a long time to turn. Um, so I agree, it is like turning an aircraft carrier, only this is a magic aircraft carrier that can turn at 45 degrees in about half a second. And the people inside that aircraft carrier, well, you get smacked from wall to wall, from chair to chair. After, let's say this is six months in an organization, that seems extreme, but I've seen organizations that change that much and sometimes in such a short time. It feels here exhausting, utterly exhausting. When I ask people what they think when they have another change, it's just not again. If you imagine, we use steel as a building material, and we like using steel because actually it's really strong, but it's also really flexible. Okay? When you use it as the main structure for a, a skyscraper, we use that because of the fact that it can sway in the wind and respond to those changing conditions. If you take a piece of steel, and you bend it, the same steel that is holding up skyscrapers around the world, and you bend it again, and you bend it again, eventually it gets metal fatigue and it breaks. That's what it's like being in an organization like this. And then there's contrast. We have this. We have a team or an organization that's very, very mindful of its changing context. And they're not making big, sweeping changes. They're making hundreds or even thousands of small changes to adjust their structure to fit their changing context. So it's all change for Harry and Sally. 
And they brought in a, a large consultancy firm. Well, Harry and Sally didn't, but the organization did. And they want to uh, change and restructure everything. They, they've moved everyone onto teams based on their skills profile. And, uh, and now Harry and Sally are on different teams in different buildings. Um, unfortunately, they actually still work on the same product. So they're spending most of their time dealing with merge conflicts and integration issues. Um, Harry and Sally find this deeply frustrating, but at least it's an excuse to work together. The, uh, Sally liked Harry. He was pretty much the reason she was still there. He was kind, supportive, intelligent, and everyone said he obviously fancied her, just too shy to do anything about it. Sally submits a pull request and assigns it to Harry. It was full of merge conflicts. Looks like there'll be lots of conflicts to deal with here. How about we deal with them over dinner? They meet that evening and decide to follow up the following week. Eight months later, the leadership announced that half of the team members are now going to be made redundant due to current economic challenges. All of the consultants seem to have disappeared as well, which is largely seen as a positive by everybody. <laughs> but Harry and Sally, aren't. their jobs are safe, uh, but obviously they're really shocked by everything. Uh, at least they're back on one team again. Harry moved into Sally's apartment. Uh, she said that he'd have to decide between the vintage comic book collection and the collection of vintage computer hardware dating from 1986 to 2001. It was a tough choice, but he decided on the comics. The computers now live in Harry, Harry's parents' attic. So when we're born, we are as authentic as we will ever be. Uh, we have no shame, no expectations, we are just us. As we grow, we develop self-awareness. And while self-awareness is in itself pretty useful, um, it does come with this sudden recognition of all the things that we don't like about ourselves, and all the expectations of family, friends and society, and the gap between the reality. So we start to create the image of the person we wish we were. Uh, the, if only I had that, could sing that, could dance that, could be that person. And as much as possible, our outward self projects that person. But the gap between who we are and how we are gets larger and larger. When we can't be ourselves, that creates a state known as cognitive dissonance. That is holding two ideas uh, in our mind at the same time. I like to dig into the definition of words. In music, dissonance means something else. That is the lack of harmony among musical notes. So when you hear somebody uh, scratching their nails down a chalkboard, or uh, if your neighbor is trying to learn the trumpet, you might experience some dissonance. And we feel this. When you feel it, even I imagine just imagining the sound of somebody scratching their nails down a chalkboard, you feel it, that icky feeling in the pit of your stomach. We feel that with people as well. When people are dissonant, when they are misaligned with themselves, they're uncomfortable in their own skin, and we can sense that discomfort. The opposite of that is consonance, when things are harmonious. And equally, we feel that in people too. We are more comfortable around people that are more comfortable with themselves. I really like the... Uh, personification in this definition from Sibelius Academy. Dissonant intervals are those that cause tension and desire to be resolved, like they have <laughs> intent. And I kind of imagine this like the who we are and the how we are, this piece of elastic between us. And the further you're away, the greater that tension is. And what that means is, is that you're putting all of this energy into just being, into just being that other person. It's wasted energy, wasted energy that could go into being the brilliant person that you already are. I think the thing to remember, and it's the thing that I certainly forgot, 
is that the best version of you, which we all strive to be, is still you. So as I said, I struggled at school. It turns out that I'm dyspraxic and dysgraphic. So the dysgraphia is what affected my handwriting, and the dyspraxia affects a whole range of things. I um, really struggle uh, sometimes to work out which way is left or right. Um, I lose things all the time. I can be kind of clumsy at times. And one thing that I really struggle with is tying my shoelaces. Um, any situation where I had to kind of take my shoes off in public, so I know changing at the gym or going through security at the airport, I'd get lots of anxiety. And then I discovered these silicon laces. Uh, you can just slip them in and voila, you look like someone that can tie their shoelaces. I could pretend to be someone and, and they looked like pro shoelace tying, like they were like perfectly tied, you know. And then as I was going through uh, Heathrow Airport, one of them snapped. Now in my mind it snapped with the volume of about 200 decibels and literally everyone in Heathrow Terminal 5 turned and stopped and pointed uh, Obviously, they didn't. <laughs> um, there's a nice paradox here, which is that uh, we always think that everyone is looking at and thinking about us. Um, and in reality, no one is doing that because everyone is too busy thinking that everyone is looking at and thinking about them. So my white silicon laces snapped. And I was on my way to a client, and I uh, went on Amazon, and Jeff Bezos kindly posted me the first set of silicon laces he had available at that particular time that just happened to be rainbows. I didn't think too much about it. I just put them in because, frankly, I just needed some laces. Um, and uh, I was at the clients, in the client's office or in their kitchen, and someone just said, oh, they look kind of cool. And I went, oh, yeah. It's because I can't tie my shoelaces. They're actually made of silicon. I was like, oh, I just outed myself. And the funny thing was is that it was in that moment where I just recognized that it was all right. You know, the world didn't stop turning. The sky didn't fall. And, and while that was just the start of a journey for me, it was that little bit of realization that I was just that little bit more aligned to myself. I wasn't pretending anymore. When a team has their ways of working dictated to them, they often find themselves working against the process. This is the same thing as individuals. It's like trying to be authentic by copying someone else who's really authentic. Teams can't copy another team that just seems to be doing so well because that process is that team's. That's their authentic way of working. And the reason that they're doing so well is because they're probably perfectly aligned to their context. When you're, <clears throat> me. When you're just copying another team, the problem is, is that that could never be perfectly aligned to your context because your context includes the people on your team. And your process will need to vary to support those people and to be aware of those people and support those people. What teams often end up doing is working on the process, but not their process. This is what I call contextual misalignment, when you're misaligned from your context. And I think that as leaders and coaches, it's important for us to be coaching teams towards contextual alignment. And that means not telling them how to do the process, but guiding them in a way that they discover and rediscover their own process that's right for their context. So a few months after all the redundancies, the team get a brand new coach. Initially, everyone is pretty resistant. They're all still uh, pretty unsettled from all of the redundancies. The new coach gives them a whiteboard and uh, just says there are three columns, to do, doing, done. He says, you don't need to worry about stories or any of that stuff. All I want you to do is to get your work, anything you're working on, get it up on that board. They're told to uh, make magnets with avatars on to show who's working on what. 
Harry chooses uh, Dame Edna Everidge, and Sally chooses the Incredible Hulk. One day they stand around the board, and once a day they stand around the board and chat about the work on there. But they find that they just naturally begin to just stand around the board whenever they're discussing the work, because it's where the work is. They still have their retrospectives every couple of weeks, but everyone seems a bit more invested in it. They are sure to try and make small experiments after every retrospective. One of the things they wanted to do was get better at demoing their work, so they simply agreed to try making a line in their done column, demoed and not demoed. It was a really small change, but it felt good to have some autonomy over the way they were working. And this team was making lots of small changes. Harry and Sally finally get to go on the holiday that they had been planning for ages. Harry tries to propose to Sally on top of the Eiffel Tower. She tells him that's way too cheesy and that he should try again another day. The next morning, he wakes up to find a gift card from Sally, uh, a driving experience day. There's no sign of Sally. The card just says, enjoy yourself, see you later. He spends the next two hours charging around the track with the Stig. To his surprise, the Stig gets down on one knee and proposes to, to, proposes to him. Removing the helmet, Sally is revealed. She just looks up, holds out the ring and says, well, if you want a job doing properly, So after all that, I ended up face to face with a homeless drug addict in Detroit. Hey man, take a picture of me. I'm the real Detroit. Well, I thought my mum's words still ringing in my mind. I guess I had it coming. I stopped and smiled and said, I'm so sorry, not letting the fear of death getting in the way of good British politeness. I'm so sorry, my camera's battery is dead. I'd love to take your photograph, but, but I can't. And then I paused for a moment, and, and I, I left my wallet at home today. I, I don't have anything else I can give you. I'm, I'm sorry. He looked at me, and I looked back at him, and we just stood there for what felt like hours. And then, breaking the silence, he just said, can I rap for you? Well, <laughs> that was surprising, but strangely, I knew that the correct answer was yes. For future reference, that's always the correct answer. So in the strangely intimate setting on the corner of a street on the edge of downtown Detroit, this man rapped for me. He told me his story. He told me how when you live with a heroin addiction, you're living with withdrawal all the time, hit to hit, desperate for relief. He told me how two nights before someone had kicked the shit out of him while he was sleeping. He doesn't know who it was, he just woke up with a boot in his face. He told me about his wife. He told me about his daughter. He told me how much he missed her, how much he loved her. He told me how he left them to protect her from the him he was becoming. When he finished, I hugged him and thanked him. We said goodbye, and I continued my walk up Cass Avenue. A moment later behind me, I heard him talking to someone. Hey, man, did you get anything? Nah, nah, my friend said. I told you, man, we're not going to get shit from people around here. Nah, my friend said. Nah. He listened to me. It's been a long time since anyone listened to me. After my relationship breakdown, I had to work out who the hell me was. But the thing I forgot is the best version of you is still you, with all your broken bits. But those things, like the sculptor's chisel, shape who you are. You'll never be without them. You do your broken bits better than anyone else. They are your superpowers, and you own them. They don't own you. Life is not about redefining yourself. It's about finding where your boundaries already are and accepting them. In a sculpture, its boundaries are what make it beautiful, and they can be what make you beautiful as well. You see, when I ask you to close your eyes and think about who you are right now, that's because, unlike a sculpture, your boundaries do change over time. We do change over time. The trick is noticing it and aligning yourself to it and not fighting it. 
When you fight who you are, you waste your energy on being that other person. And it's harder and harder to be the wonderful person you already are. So back in 2019, I returned to Detroit. And as I walked up Woodward Avenue, I was reminded kindly by Facebook that I'd been there on that day two years before. Only this time, I'd just delivered that workshop and it had sold out. As I reconnected with myself and discovered my own superpowers over that two years, I've had more success and, most importantly, had more close friends than I ever had before. As me and my friend walked up the street, we saw the Detroit Museum of Contemporary Art in the distance. When I'd walked up there previously, it was painted with pink and yellow murals, although this time it looked like it was all black in the distance. I thought maybe they were between murals. It was an undercoat of some kind. When we got up there, I realized there was a mural on there, white neon lights across the front. It just said, everything's going to be all right, the famous lyrics from Bob Marley. When I was in Detroit the first time, I was broken and in pain. But this city, with all of the suffering it has endured over the last 50 years, is a city of community, a city of pride, and a city of hope a city that, despite everything, has held on to its authenticity. It's held on to the real Detroit. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>